Epidural anesthesia and analgesia is commonly used in the perioperative period for major surgical procedures. Epidural anesthesia is administered with general anesthesia during surgical procedures to blunt the stress response of surgery and to provide prolonged postoperative analgesia with the use of an epidural catheter. Neuraxial anesthesia refers to the administration of local anesthetic medications into the spinal or epidural space. Epidural anesthesia is conducted by injecting local anesthetic solutions into the epidural space. The benefits of regional anesthesia, as well as the absolute and relative contraindications to performing neuraxial anesthesia, are discussed in Chapter 16 of the Ottawa Anesthesia Primer. Spinal surface landmarks are identified by palpating the spinous processes at the desired level of blockade. The three most easily identified spinous landmarks are the 7th cervical, 7th thoracic, and 4th lumbar vertebrae. When flexed, the C7 spinous process is the most prominent posterior bony structure in the neck. The 7th thoracic spinous process is generally at the level of the inferior tip of the scapula. A line drawn across the superior aspects of the iliac crest, termed Tuffier's line, usually intersects the body of the 4th lumbar vertebrae above the L4-5 interspace. Tracing the 12th rib back to its spinal attachment can be used to identify the 12th thoracic vertebrae. From these reference points, other levels can be identified by palpating and counting the spinous processes above and below the reference levels. Prior to performing epidural anesthesia, an intravenous is established and standard monitors including pulse oximetry and a non-invasive blood pressure monitor are applied. The patient can be positioned either sitting or on their side. The patient is instructed to curl and round their lower back to open the spaces between the spinous processes. The epidural space extends from the frame and magnum to the sacral hiatus. Epidural anesthesia may be performed at the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar levels. Flexion of the spine distracts the spinous processes which increases the distance between them and facilitates access to the epidural and spinal space. An interspinous space that corresponds to the mid to upper level of the surgical incision is chosen for insertion of the epidural needle. An epidural needle has a much wider diameter bore than a spinal needle. The wider bore allows a catheter to be passed through the needle into the epidural space. The tip of the needle is blunt to decrease the chance of it inadvertently piercing the dura. The tip is also beveled up to facilitate passage of the catheter into the epidural space. One centimeter markings along the epidural needle allows the clinician to easily identify the depth of the needle from the skin to the epidural space. In the epidural space, the nerve roots are protected in a myelin sheath as they exit the spinal cord. Local anesthetics in the epidural space must diffuse through the myelin sheath to exert their anesthetic effect. As a result, epidural anesthesia typically has a slower onset and requires five to 10 times more anesthetic drug compared with spinal anesthesia. Common local anesthetic medications used for epidural anesthesia include ropivacaine, lidocaine, and bupivacaine. The addition of a small amount of epinephrine to the local anesthetic has been shown to improve the quality of the epidural anesthesia for thoracic epidurals. A 3 mil test dose of 1.5% lidocaine with epinephrine can be used to test the placement of the epidural catheter. A dense and rapid motor block would suggest the catheter is in the intrathecal CSF space and not the epidural space. A rapid increase in the heart rate following the test dose would suggest the epidural catheter tip has inadvertently entered a vein. Opioids are commonly co-administered with local anesthetics during spinal and epidural anesthesia. Extremely small doses of neuraxial opioids, such as two milligrams of epidural morphine, can provide profound and prolonged postoperative analgesia. Neuraxial opioids improve postoperative and labor analgesia and are discussed in chapters 17 to 19 of the Ottawa Anesthesia Primer. The three most common epidural opioids used are fentanyl, morphine, and hydromorphone. A strict aseptic technique with a hat, mask, and sterile gloves is used when performing neuraxial anesthesia.
After positioning the patient, the skin is cleansed with an alcohol-based chlorhexidine solution and sterile drapes are applied. Local anesthesia using 1-2% to plain lidocaine through a fine gauge needle is used to minimize patient discomfort with the procedure. Small amounts of intravenous sedative and analgesic medications such as midazolam and fentanyl may also be administered to minimize patient discomfort and anxiety. Pedural anesthesia may be performed at any interspace in the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. A midline or less commonly paramedian approach is used to perform epidural anesthesia. Using a midline approach, the needle is entered between the spinous processes and directed cephalad approximately 10 to 15 degrees toward the spinal canal. The needle is advanced through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and ligamentum flavum. The epidural space is identified immediately after advancing the needle through the ligamentum flavum using a loss of resistance to air or saline technique. In an adult, the epidural space is typically entered between 4 to 6 centimeters from the skin. Once the space is identified, an epidural catheter is commonly passed through the needle into the epidural space. The catheter is then left in the epidural space and the needle is removed. Local anesthetics with or without opioids are then injected through the epidural catheter, permitting a slow titration of the local anesthetic drug. Intermittent aspiration is performed to ensure that the epidural catheter has not inadvertently entered a blood vessel or the spinal fluid. This patient was scheduled for an upper abdominal procedure. The epidural insertion is performed using a sterile technique with non-invasive monitoring and appropriate intravenous sedation. 2% lidocaine is infiltrated with a fine 25 gauge needle into the skin, subcutaneous tissues, and interspinous ligament. The epidural needle is inserted into the interspinous ligament to a depth of 3 centimeters. The epidural stylet is removed and a loss of resistance to air technique is used to identify the epidural space. The epidural catheter is inserted into the epidural space. The distance from the skin to the epidural space is obtained by counting the markings on the epidural needle and in this patient the space was identified at a depth of 4.5 centimeters from the skin. The catheter is placed into the epidural space and the epidural needle is removed by backing the needle out over the catheter, ensuring the catheter stays in place. The catheter is secured at a depth of 10 centimeters from the level of the skin such that the catheter is left inside the epidural space approximately 5 centimeters. A syringe is attached and negative pressure is used to confirm that the catheter has not entered a blood vessel or the CSF space. 3 mils of 1.5% lidocaine with epinephrine is administered to test the placement of the catheter. The catheter is secured using a sterile occlusive dressing. A dilute solution of bupivacaine with fentanyl and epinephrine was used to establish the epidural block. Adverse effects from the administration of a large dose of local anesthetic injected rapidly into a vein or the spinal fluid is avoided by testing the catheter and administering small doses of the local anesthetic through the catheter as well as the use of continuous infusion techniques. Post-operative analgesia can be maintained for several days after major surgery. Continuous epidural infusion techniques can be used to facilitate early mobilization and physiotherapy while minimizing the use of systemic opioids and their associated side effects such as nausea, hallucinations, and constipation. The anesthesia team assesses the patients daily to ensure the epidural is working properly and to address any patient concerns.